Have you ever attended the open casket funeral of a loved one or friend? Staring down at their lifeless body, seeing death, the absence of a soul or a spark of animation, can be a humbling moment. In the early 1100s, up until the late 1800s, certain monastic orders would engage in a similar premise using what were called putridariums, wherein the bodies of deceased members of the order would be placed and allowed to rot. In a metaphorical semblance of purgatory, their bodies would decay, flesh and meat disintegrating around them and members of the order would come and kneel in the presence of these corpses in various state of entropy, and reflect on death, and the passage of life into it, and what waiteth in the beyond. In certain circles, these rooms contained funeral chairs, special seats for the bodies, that included a circular cutout in the base, and a basin would be placed beneath it, to accumulate the various fluids released in decomposition. The last of these buildings fell out of use when the Nazis shelled it during the London Blitz. The devastation was so severe that cracks in the foundation allowed centuries of accumulated corpse fluids to seep into the groundwater, permeate the water table itself. But for the burning of all the necromancers in the late ninth century, this could have been a devastating turn of events in the war, because already facing an affront of Nazis and the axis of evil, they would have had no chance had they found themselves pinned between that and a zombie horde. These are dark times. And these stories come from very dark places. Hello listeners, my name is Jonas Armitage and you're listening to Stories from Dark Places. This week, Halloween finally graces our little village and towns and cities and the states across this great country. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm positively vibrating with excitement. I've always loved the spooky month. As children, my brother Philip and I would dress in costumes the moment we climbed out of bed in the morning and have to be pried out of them the end of the night, unconscious from too much sugar and far too much excitement. This year, in light of the pandemic, I think I shall be tucking myself in to watch some good movies listen to the sounds of children out on the street, exploring the night and tempting the creatures that lurk within it. Our station staff has their own respective ways of embracing the night as it comes. I know that Kai the intern is going to a party with at least one young woman, and I know that the Gardinez family is looking forward to handing candy out and enjoying a quiet night with themselves and their young. To all of you out there, I hope you have a safe and celebratory Halloween. In fact, what are you going to do? I'd love to hear about it. So please, message us on Twitter, Stories from DAR1, or email us at storiesfromdarkplaces at gmail.com and tell us about your Halloween plans. In a moment, she'll take you out to... Our new story, Abyssal Gigantism, and see just how many of you recoil from the bottomless ocean. But first, a message from our sponsors. Are you itching for a good story? Laughter among friends, maybe even a mystery or two? Well, you're in luck. Fire Breathing Kittens is a standalone Dungeons & Dragons podcast. Each episode is a separate three-hour-long story, like a movie for your ears, so you can listen to these adventures in any order you like. So, join us on a real play D&D quest as we solve mysteries, attempt comedic banter, and enjoy friendship. Fire Breathing Kittens podcast. Fantasy, action, mystery, friendship. Oh. 
All my life I've been fascinated with the deep sea. 200 meters down, couldn't care less. 1,000 meters down, yawn. No. Deep in the sea, somewhere around 2,000 meters below sea level, the abyssal zone begins. The creatures that live there will never see the sunlight. The only light they can see is that which they make themselves. Down there, in the dark. That's where the monsters are. I always had an affinity for Lovecraftian creatures. Your Cthulhu, your Azathoth. But in my heart, I knew those were fiction. No. No, the real monsters in the world are squid, larger than a building, with a beak that could shatter a Humvee. Legions of shrimp grown to the size of small cars. Even in captivity, a goldfish will inevitably grow as large as its little bull can support. So does every other fish in the sea. We never really know how big they get. We know more about the moon than we do about the ocean floor and the creatures that live there. That mystery, that... That was what drove me through my undergrad, through my graduate program, and eventually through my postgrad work and some of the foremost marine biology departments in the Pacific, before I ended up working with a well-known research institute based out of Guam. All of this has led up to today's expedition. Today I would finally see my Xanadu, Mariana's Trench. It reaches almost seven miles underwater straight down, over 11,000 feet. Somewhere in the bottom of that trench... There are incredible beasts of untold size, proportions, and beauty. Over the course of my career, I established myself as a steadfast, trustworthy academic. No life beyond my work, but that just let me focus on my goal. Months ago, I palmed the keys to the storeroom in the Emma, the department's ancient expeditionary boat. I made a copy and returned the keys the next day. If anyone noticed, they said nothing. Over the course of the next few months, supplies around the lab started to go missing. A wetsuit here, a rebreather there. No one would dare suspect the dedicated, beleaguered researcher. Maybe some poor research assistant caught hell. Not my problem. I stayed late tonight told my colleagues I just needed to wait for some results back, and I promise I'll get a good night's rest. They thought my nervous shake was from my caffeine habit, but really I just couldn't wait for them to leave. When the last man left, I waited thirty minutes, grabbed my stash of illicit goods, and made for the Emma. You don't get through ten years of work in marine biology without knowing your way around a boat. I eased myself into the cold metal seat of the heavy pilot's chair, maneuvered the Emma smoothly out of its dock and off the campus. I knew there would be no alarms and no reason to watch for me. Still, I turned every light on the small research vessel off until I was well out of sight of land. I had a journey of hundreds of miles ahead of me, and I knew I couldn't take any chances. I couldn't lose so much work. The boat was only twenty-five or so feet long. It wasn't built for long journeys like this across unprecedented, unpredictable oceans. But I knew she had more than enough gas for one last voyage. By the time I reached the ping on my ship's navigation, the sun was beginning to peek out of the horizon to the east. I knew my department would soon realize the Emma was missing but I couldn't make myself care. Soon they would also realize I hadn't made any substantial progress in half a year. I always did just enough, looked just busy enough. No one would look twice, and who could question me? Now that I think of it, I don't know that I could remember a single one of their faces. None of that matters now. The only thing that does is where I am. I looked down into the dark blue ocean. It lays in wait, aching to be seen, 
to be felt. The Marianas Trench has been calling me all my life, and now I can finally answer the call. I can hardly zip the wetsuit up in my hands or shaking so bad, and for the final trick I wrench the pilot's chair free. With a length of chain I'd stashed away, I tie it to my leg. I fitted the mask with a transmitter, feeding my words directly into this document. Once the transmission ends, this will end up in the hands of someone I trust. Well, that's you, I guess. And like that, my preparations are complete. My life's work, it's all happening now. With one final glance towards my sweet Emma and the sky behind her, I close my eyes. I hold the chair close and ease myself backwards into the deep. It's cold, but I don't mind. I think I can feel the pressure changing, welcoming me home, the embrace of my great old one. wish that I could see more. I think that's my mask. Feel it coming. Soon I will meet the ocean face to face. And when the darkness rushes in to meet me, we will become one. And I will grow larger than you will ever know. I will become another beautiful.
As we pass through life and death, metamorphosis comes to us all. We must change and evolve, as we are limited creatures, and growth is reliant not only on us for our own survival, but for the survival of our children and the generations to come. I'm not entirely certain how that would apply to turning into a massive eldritch monstrosity at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, but I'm sure that someone out there has a personal connection and can really understand what the narrator was going through. I am not him. I hate the ocean when I can't see the bottom. I don't ever want to go deep scuba diving. That's absolutely terrifying. I'd rather stay right here with my feet on the ground, and I don't want to see tentacles unless I'm eating them deep fried. There, I've said it. Anyway, thank you all for joining us tonight. We'd like to give a special thank you to our Twitter followers, YouTube followers, our subscribers on podcast platforms all across the internet, as well as our sponsors and those in the podcast community who have reached out and taken time to share our podcast with their listeners and give us the opportunity to share their podcast with our listeners. I do encourage you to seek them out should you need good stories, and you're not quite in the mood for what I'm selling. Anyway, that's all the time we have for now. Good night, listeners. And please, regardless of what I've said, the next time you find yourself out on the water and you look down into the murky depths below you, remember, there's nothing to be afraid of. After all, some of the best things only happen in the dark. Stories from Dark Places was recorded before an imaginary studio audience. All stories performed on this podcast have expressed written consent from the original author. Jonas Armitage, his studio manager, and the entire staff of WZHP Radio Innsmouth are fictitious characters, and it's probably for the best that you continue to believe that. Hello, listeners. Looking for more tales to entertain with esoteric delight and supernatural suspense? I would encourage you to check out Peculiar Stories, Join Indiana Beckett as she takes you on a walk around her particular side of the neighborhood in all things strange and unusual. You may find her on Anchor Podcasts or anywhere that your podcast can be found.